Hello and welcome to another episode of the Wisdom of Friends podcast. Thank Thank you for tuning in. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. This is a podcast where you get to learn more about your friends and community, their wisdom, their trials and tribulations, timeless insights and their secrets. Now, let's get into the show. Please welcome your host, Cal Aras. Hello and welcome to the Wisdom of Friends podcast. Today we have with us an exciting guest. I'm really thrilled to have him on the show. His name is Jim Salton. Now you need to know a little bit about Jim. He is a leader in the community, a seasoned speaker and a distinguished Toastmaster. He's now retired from a 36-year career in architectural lighting. He served as a Studio Lux Vice President and a Senior Designer. Jim has brought exceptional knowledge and fresh ideas for the architectural lighting design to the Pacific Northwest. Jim has actively served in numerous leadership positions for the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America at the local, regional, and national levels, and continues to serve on several committees. In his private life, Jim is an active member of Toastmasters International, has served on the International Board of Directors, and has three times achieved Toastmasters International's highest educational award of Distinguished Toastmaster. Upon retirement, Jim has opened a consulting company gearing towards training management and sales teams on communication and leadership skills and the art of effective presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelt and let's welcome the one and only Jim Sultan. So good afternoon, Jim. And welcome to the Wisdom of Friends podcast. Uh, we're excited to have you on the show. And I just want to say I appreciate you taking the time to be on this uh, call today. And let me start by saying uh, what I really find fascinating about you is I remember the first time I met you was at the Kirkland Eclectics Toastmasters Club. And one thing that stood out about the way you presented uh, your speeches was the articulation and the command on the language. And as I got to know you better as part of the Improv Club and through the Toastmasters conferences, uh, I learned a little bit more about your background and I knew that you are a fascinating individual and we would like to have you on the show. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to be on this call. Thank you, Cal. It's my pleasure. Now, one of the ways we start off our shows is uh, that, you know, the first question is, what's your favorite quote or philosophy you live by and how have you applied it to your life? A lot of people pay a lot of respect to quotations by other people. And I think that things that people have said in the past is very, very critical to know, but not necessarily a philosophy of my own life. I would rather take my own quote and live my life by that. So my quote is, the answer is always no if you fail to ask the question. Hmm. And it's great, again, to listen to other great philosophies and ideas, but I feel that one should come up with their own. So the answer is always no if you fail to ask the question. I am always asking questions. I am always seeking information. Some of my favorite television shows are documentaries because I try to learn new things. And as I've progressed through my life and have been a part of various organizations and the like, I don't stay at the peripheral. I work my way into the heart of this organization or group or whatever it may be and become totally involved. And I do that by asking questions and then sharing the knowledge that I I learn with other people. I couldn't agree more, Jim. I think if you don't ask, you do not receive. And uh, that's one of the great uh, uh, philosophies to live by. Uh, What I'm curious about, Jim, is I know a little bit about you, but I really would like to hear you share about your journey, uh, about your life, as to 
Uh, how did you end up getting into uh, lightning and architecture? I understand that was your primary uh, profession. And uh, what got you fascinated and interested into that field? Uh, and how did you get to doing what you're doing today? You know, sometimes it's a series of happy accidents that get you where you are. I mean, here I am, 66. I'm retired. I have lived a very, very full life, done many, many things. One of the first jobs I had was when I was 10 years old. I worked for my father in a store that my grandfather owned and then my father inherited selling shoe repair supplies. And I eventually became a salesman on the road. And I was 16 years old, driving around the southern half of Minnesota, visiting shoe repair and shoe stores and trying to sell our product. That got me involved with sales and with dealing with people. Nothing I was ever embarrassed or reluctant to try. I had had several years of training in my father's store where people would come in and buy things. So I had the atmosphere of sales. And I went from there and I became a shoe salesman. Went on to school and college and I struggled with what I wanted to do when I was in college. I couldn't settle on anything. My parents were the ones who said, be a teacher. It was like a fallback position, become a teacher. So I studied and got a Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education, specializing in history and social studies. My major in college was ancient history with a minor in theater arts. I loved history. For several years, I taught in a few different schools. In Minnesota, I was a substitute teacher in three different school districts. And I had a, a job at the Talmud Torah of St. Paul teaching religion and actually the history of the Holocaust, which was challenging. In 1973, I got married, and in 76, my wife and I moved to Jerusalem. I had every intention of settling in Israel as an immigrant. It had been a dream. I found a job actually working in three different schools, teaching English as a foreign language. My wife was working at the Hebrew University and at Hadassah Hospital. So she was in the library at the Hebrew University and at Hadassah Hospital. She was working with a geologist and helping to transcribe a book he was writing. We were in Israel for a year and a half and a couple of things happened. We basically went broke trying to learn the system and delays in being paid and inflation eventually used up everything that we had. It also taught me that I didn't want to be a teacher, not a formal teacher in that sense of the word. I came around to teaching again years later, but I had a hard time with younger students. I couldn't tolerate noise and disorder. And so it was a very difficult thing for me to do. When we came back, we moved to San Diego where my parents had moved just before. My father had had several people who promised that, oh, we've got a job for Jim as soon as he gets here. And of course, none of those happened. I went looking for a job and the one that I found was a salesman selling and installing water treatment systems. This is where I learned plumbing because mm -hmm. I had no idea what plumbing was until I started to sell and install these systems. However, I believe that you must have faith in the product that you are promoting. And after eight months, I discovered that the product that I was selling was not as effective as the literature claimed. Mm. So I got out. At that time, my father was an insurance salesman, and he had done a profile for a man who was a manufacturer's representative in the lighting industry. I see. This person had someone who had just left his employee and was looking. All right. I knew nothing about lighting. My idea of electricity is if I try to 
build an extension cord. I stood back when I plugged it in to make sure <laughs> it didn't explode. I had a healthy respect, born of fear of electricity. But I went and then interviewed with Sam Arden, who was my first employer in this industry. As manufacturers' representatives, our major job was selling, selling our product or trying to convince electrical contractors and specifiers to use our product lines. Somehow, Sam saw something in me. And I worked for him for three years until he retired and the company changed ownership. And during that three years, Sam did everything in, his, in the world to train me. He would send me to manufacturers' schooling, special courses, the Illuminating Engineering Society. He introduced me to that organization and I took their basic and their advanced courses. So I learned. And at the beginning, he had me calling on architects because he figured that if I was speaking to an electrical engineer, they would eat me alive. I didn't know all the terminology and the calculations, but these are things that he took the time to teach me. And through the courses that I was taking, that was giving me that kind of training. So I got this job by accident. Had no idea of what lighting was about. I went from that first job to working for an electrical wholesaler, then back to another representative, then to a lighting showroom, all the time learning and growing. And it got to the point when I joined the lighting showroom, I designed and personally installed a 1,200-square-foot light lab demonstrating hundreds of different lighting effects, including designing installing and programming three different lighting control systems. Mm. By now, I knew pretty much what I was doing. I left that company when I opened up my own design firm in 1993 in San Diego. And I left that company when I was recruited by Studio Lux here in Seattle. And I joined Studio Lux as a senior lighting designer, eventually became vice president. So this whole moving forward in, in my career has been fortuitous accidents, but also a lot of training, so I knew what I was doing. I eventually went back and I taught college courses to interior design and architecture students on lighting, because by then it was a passion. Now that's a fascinating uh, story, Jim, and uh, sounds like... Uh you know, one of the questions that I always get from young individuals and graduates is, how do I find my profession? How do I find my calling? And one of the things that I always tell them is, uh, sometimes it's always a happy accident. Sometimes uh, you end up knowing uh, right up front what is it that you want to do. Sometimes it's you have to have enough experiences in life where you kind of get a lay of the land before you know what you really want to do. Uh, so there is no one way or one path towards your calling. And it seems like uh, you've had some really uh, fortunate uh, mentors along the way. Uh, sounds like your first boss uh, really took an active interest in you and uh, uh, trained you in a direction that you ended up becoming the vice president of that company. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit about your childhood. Uh, and it's funny that you mentioned San Diego because I lived in San Diego for many years before I moved to Seattle. So we got a similar arc of migrating over to uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, from the Pacific, uh, beautiful San Diego. Uh, growing up, whom did you idolize and uh, who were your mentors and what fascinated you about them? That's a great question. My greatest mentor was my father. How I idolized him, I don't think I idolized him per se, because the lessons that he taught me were not, were not taught in that way. It was more of gaining insight through osmosis. My father was a remarkable man. I have never met anybody as organized as he 
I have never met anybody who embraced learning the way that he did. He was interested in everything and everybody. When he passed away, we found, with my mother, we found discs and CDs and everything neatly labeled of these courses that he learned, these lectures that he gave. It was really a remarkable story, but I'll tell you the story that the impressed me most. My father told me this starting when I was very, very young. During World War II, he participated in the armies in Belgium. And shortly before the Battle of the Bulge, he was sent on a scouting mission. He led a troop of scouts behind enemy lines through a minefield to observe what the enemy's strength was. This is when he discovered that the strength of that enemy was far beyond what was anticipated by the leadership. When he was coming back at night, they had to go through the minefield again. A soldier next to him stepped on an anti-personnel mine, mm. blew off part of his foot, and the shrapnel hit my dad in the eyes. The rest of his troop made it back safely, but here was a guy who can't walk and another guy who can't see. Well, the soldier who had his foot blown off crawled over to my father, put sulfur powder in his eyes and wrapped his eyes. There was still shrapnel sticking out of, it was not through the eye, but something in the orbit, outside the orbit of the eye, through the eyelid. And of course, that was very painful for dad, but it probably saved his sight. One man can't see, the other man can't walk. My father took the soldier who had blown off his foot, put him on his shoulders, and with that soldier acting as the eyes, my father were, were the legs. They went through the minefield and made it back to friendly lines. He gave his report and then passed out. Wow. That has been the most inspiring story of my life. That is uh, fascinating and that's amazing that you share that. It, it's his mentorship of others that has inspired me, and not necessarily consciously, but the person that I have become, become today, mentoring others, caring more about others' growth, that came from my father. And that's in retrospect that I have to say that. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Jim. Uh, I want to go back to your trip to Israel, and uh, what uh, one of the questions that I am curious about is, when you moved to Israel with your wife, and uh, I mean, of course, there were some struggles, as you shared, but what fascinated you about Israel? What was that country back then? And I'm curious if you've gone back again after coming to the States, and uh, what was your experience after having gone back? My first trip to Israel was in 1970, so I was 19 years old. It was a summer trip for youth organization. And at the time, especially when I walked into Jerusalem, <laughs> we drove, but when we first arrived into Jerusalem, it was like coming home. Mm. I've, I've, Judaism has very, been a very strong part of my life. I grew up in a conservative but observant household. I just had this tremendous feeling of coming home. As we traveled around the country, this feeling grew. And I knew at that time that someday I'd like to live in this country. And one of the things I told my wife before we got married is that someday we're going to move to Israel. And she was that's fine, you know, whatever you want, that's great. So when we got there in 1973, I'm sorry, 76, it was truly like coming home. And I would not live any place other than Jerusalem, which is a mistake from the point of view that that's why I went broke. If I had chosen to live elsewhere in a less expensive environment, lived on a kibbutz or a moshav, mm. it would have been totally different. But it, it had to be Jerusalem. 
And we constantly toured the country. We went all over the country. I loved the people. I loved the attitude. I loved the weather. I loved the history. And again, with an ancient history background, I was walking on stones of of history. And that that was a remarkable, remarkable thing for me. Wow. Wow. Uh, we're going to switch some gears here. And uh, one question I do have for you and always wanted to ask you this is, how would you define success? Having lived life through all the uh, various travels and ups and downs, and how would you define success and how would you define greatness for an individual? Is it the same for all? Or is it different? Or what? Uh, well, what's your take on that? That's an excellent question. To me, if you are happy with what you are doing in your life, if you are happy in your job, then your job is worth doing. If you're unhappy in your job, go find something else. Mm. You need to be satisfied because that's more than half of your life is what you're doing for a living. If you have a warm, loving family or just wife, if that be the case, and you have a few, at least a few friends that you know that you can count on, you're eating regularly, you have, you're comfortable with the home in, in which you are, you're not constantly wanting more and more and more. I mean, it's nice to have things, but without that niggling desire to accumulate, if you're happy in your life and with the people with whom you're surrounded, that's success. Mm. Greatness is when you when you share that happiness with others and teach them to do the same. Wow, that's that's a beautiful. Yeah. Uh, now switching gears again. Uh, so on that same track, what do you, what what do you think stops people from achieving their fullest potential? Again, a great question. I think it has to do with themselves holding themselves back. It can be nervousness or fear. It can be lack of self-confidence. But anybody can do anything that they put their mind to. And it's something inside that is telling them, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. And if it's somebody outside saying, no, you can't, then your job is to prove that person wrong. Mm. That's at least in my experience. I've never seen anybody, I've seen people try and fail. That happens. But if you haven't failed, it's like not asking the question. My question is, can I be successful in this business? I've got an answer. It's no. That's okay. It's like saying sometimes you ask God from something and sometimes the answer is no. It's okay to fail. But that doesn't mean that you're a failure. That means that wasn't the thing that you were meant to do. Go find it. That's excellent. And one of the ways that I look at failure is also that uh, one of the quotes that stuck with me early on is, God's delays are not God's denials. And sometimes uh, things don't happen on our timeline that we wanted to see, and sometimes it takes longer and it could all be in the best interest because when you look back and you see that uh, things happen on their own times and that works out really well. Yeah. And if you talk about quotes by others, think of Thomas Edison. It took him a thousand tries to discover the proper filament for an incandescent lamp. And his response when somebody asked him about it is, you failed 999 times. He said, no. I learned 999 ways not to make no. an incandescent lamp. Yes. <laughs> That's such a great story. Um, what action do you think people can take towards creating heaven on earth? And what I mean by that is with all kinds of conflict going on around the world and their, and, and their uh, communities and organizations. And So what could people do in their own ways to create peace and create uh, a sense of community uh, no matter where they live. 
Well, my flip pad answer is everybody in the world should join Toastmasters <laughs> because it's an organization that transcends political, geological, racial, sexual borders. There, there are no borders within Toastmasters, and it's a reason that we're in over 140 countries. But not everybody is going to join Toastmasters. The secret to creating a harmonious society is recognizing the other person's right to state their opinion. You may not agree with it, but that person has a right to state their opinion. I, what I see in Facebook is totally different from the Facebook of five years ago. People are being vilified for stating their opinion. Terribly, terrible things are being said from one person to the next on Facebook because someone dares to express their opinion. That means that we're not being tolerant. That means that we're not being understanding. Mm. And where you have lack of understanding and lack of tolerance and lack of respect for every individual, then you're going to have strife. I agree. And, uh, and that's such a fantastic point because I think that's one of the things that uh, we as a modern society uh, have uh, lost lately is tolerance and the respect and the, and the fact that it's okay to disagree but uh, with respect. And uh, that's something I believe is absolutely an essential point. Uh, Another question that I have for you is, if you had to go back in time, and this is just a hypothetical, and talk to your 20-year-old, what advice would you give him? The young Jim Sultan at 20, what would you say to him about life? I would have told myself back then to shut up, to stop talking so much and start listening. Mm. That's something that I didn't learn for way too long. And I still tend to speak up probably faster than most people. I'm generally among the first to express my opinion, even when I'm saying in the back of my mind, shut up, shut up, shut up. But in those days, I didn't. And in those days, I was more impressed by the knowledge that I could share than by learning new knowledge. That's great. <laughs> uh, moving on to this, uh, another section of our Wisdom of Friends podcast. This is called the Rapid Fire Round, where I'm going to ask you a question and you just have a few seconds to respond back. And of course, you can take time to elaborate on it if you would like, uh, but this is uh, generally the Rapid Fire Round. So Jim, are you ready for the Rapid Fire Round? Go ahead. So the first question I have for you is, if you could be successful in another profession, what would you choose? Politics. Hmm. And if you could only say one thing from your house, what would that be? I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Yeah, if you could save only one thing from the house, for if you had to just take one piece of art or... Uh, okay. And if you had to just walk out of the house with one thing that's very important to you, what would that be? My wife. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, what color describes you best? Purple. Mm. If God exists, can she be trusted? Oh, absolutely. If you could ask God one question. What comes next? <laughs> and um, the final rapid draw fire question for you. If you could have one message of your choice on a billboard, what would that be? There is no try. <laughs> Reminds me of good old Yoda. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, Jim, this has been really fascinating, and uh, uh, I have a few other, a few last questions for you. One of the things that I would like to ask you is, uh, what are you working on today? What's your current passion project? What are you looking forward to over the next six months? Well, I'm retired, as I said. If you look around the house, you can see that I'm back to 
a hobby that I had when I was a child, building model ships and planes and the like. Family is a big thing. My children and grandchildren live fairly close to me. Mm. And so I'm able to visit with them. I go for almost daily walks with my son. So his family is, is critical. I am continually active in Toastmasters. Anything I can do to help other people grow, that is my passion. And enjoying life. I've worked for an awfully long time. And being retired is probably the best job that I've got right now because I can just sit back and enjoy life, do what I want to do, help out when I'm needed, and enjoy the world. Mm. Three things you are grateful for in life today. Three things I'm grateful for in life today. I'm grateful for the love and support of my parents. I'm grateful for the love and support of my family. I am grateful for the experiences of life because every day has been a wonder in some way, even when it's a bad day. Mm. That's so great, Jim. Uh, I would like to acknowledge you for your authenticity and your inspiration to all the young adults and uh, all of us here at Toastmasters. And, and a fascinating journey all the way that started from Israel back to the U.S. and and starting your own business and then learning from your fascinating uh, dad and uh, amazing values that uh, uh, you've lived by all your life and, uh, and some of the things you mentioned about your family being so important to you and faith. And it's such an inspiring story, Jim, and uh, truly, truly an honor to be here. Uh, uh, getting to know you more and uh, for you to take the time to share your wisdom with us. Uh, one final question. This is how we all wrap our interviews. And the final question is, why do you think people should listen to the wisdom of friends? This is an opportunity for you to learn more about what make, makes people tick than listening to the sound bites that they utter. There are a lot of wise people out there, but life experiences are where this wisdom comes from. And if you want to grow to the point where you can be sharing with others, learning about the path that others took is very important. Thank you so much again, Jim, for your time and candid answers. I appreciated our conversation. And with that, those of you listening, we'll wrap up with that. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Wisdom of Friends show with Cal Aras. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, theglobalcontribution.com. To your friends and colleagues, be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous episodes. This has been a Seven Symphonies production. Join us next time for another edition of the Wisdom of Friends.